I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This episode is a little bit different because it features two guests and we are discussing apples. There's a bittersweet note to this episode as having broken my front tooth in half as a child, I don't have a love of eating them fresh because my repaired tooth can't deal with the rigours of being sunk into the firm flesh of an apple. However, I do love them cooked and I like apple juice and more than anything, I enjoy them as trees. So it was with great interest that I read my first guest, Naomi Slade's book, An Orchard Odyssey. Naomi's book runs through the practicalities of growing apples, but it appealed to me especially because it's so beautifully written and because it asks us to reconsider how we view orchards and particularly how we can use them within our communities. I started by asking Naomi how the book came about. Well, it sort of happened organically. I've always been into tree fruit. I've always loved tree fruit. My grandmother grew apple trees when I was little and I walked down the garden I fell in love with this huge apple and it was a huge fairy tale it was as big as my head and I fed him my apple and I'd go and visit it very frequently and I was captivated by it and there were all sorts of things about that um, time of life um, my father would send me up to the cherry tree in the garden in Bristol to pick the cherries and my maternal grandfather would turn up the big trays of, of Victoria plums which was you know stuff of dreams for a seven-year-old and so I've always been felt very very connected to um, orchards to tree fruit of all descriptions but as I got a little bit older it dawned on me that my my connection was very unusual um, that it was French and South African golden delicious sort of handed out with a bit of cheese in schools in the 70s um, and then Rather later, I, I, I was doing some painting in my mother's house and some girls walked past and they were like, oh, look, cherries. And the other one was like, oh, I don't think those are cherries. It's like, well, they look like cherries. Maybe we should try them. And then the other one went, oh, no, no, we shouldn't. They're probably poisonous. And I went, what do you mean they're poisonous? Well, I didn't get what they mean they're poisonous because I was inside. But I couldn't quite believe that they couldn't, in their teens, identify a cherry. And that was kind of the germ. That was the germ of, of, of the idea, um, which, which I then picked up rather later. What is the definition of an orchard or, or, or what is the definition of an orchard as you see it? Because I think in your book, you mentioned that they may come in different configurations. Absolutely, yes. Well, an orchard um, for conservation purposes um, is defined as five trees with crown edges not more than 20 metres apart. Um, and that's very much a conservation uh, purposes for ancient orchards is this an orchard or is it not an orchard but actually if you repurpose that definition when I mean, 20 meters apart is a huge area and in a small courtyard with modern dwarfing varieties you can easily have five fruit trees um, or five adjacent houses each with a tree in its back garden um, so I mean again my book An Orchard Odyssey was about looking for fruit trees in the landscape and seeing orchards uh, where there are aggregations of fruit trees that might almost be haphazard or incidental on the edges of allotments or along roads or uh, or canals or something so it's about seeing fruit trees in a different way so you get situations where for example uh, a business has bought an old an old house in the center of town but they might re-landscape the gardens but there may still be fruit trees in there and if there are five trees within that space, then that surely could be defined as an orchard and enjoyed as such. Mm. So your challenge is really to think, rethink the idea of an orchard. Um, how does that benefit people? Can, can we make anything of the fact that there might be, you know, trees on disparate patches of land? How does, how does that work? I, I think we can. I mean, there are, there are various levels in this, the way I see it. Um, and the key thing for me is to reconnect people with their orchard heritage. I mean, I feel that certainly until relatively recently, people considered orchards to be something historic and gone and sorely missed. A sort of a sepia retrospect, oh, they were lovely, but they're all gone now and I could never have one. But I think people really can have an orchard if they think about it in the right way. Um, you know, fruit planting along front gardens um, and community orchards um, and, and 
even even in parks and landscapes, you do get orchard trees. So it's celebrating the orchard trees, you know, where there's a walnut tree park um, planted in a car park, for example, or a park which is somebody's put, put an ornamental mulberry in. I mean, ornamental mulberries taste very nice. I scrub them regularly. <laughs> actually what you said I think in the book is that you may have uh, a fragment of an historical orchard near you Um, how would people know that is it just a case of keeping your eyes open Um, yes I mean very much it's about looking for them I mean the the charge is very much to go and see the fruit trees that are in the landscape. I mean, you often see them, don't you, zipping down the motorways at this time of year. They're all dripping with beautiful golden fruit. But your mind isn't preoccupied, apart from the driving bit, when you're zipping down motorways. But even as you walk around town, you can. there might be a fig here or a kiwi there or, or as I say, a mulberry or, or self-set apples in the park. Um, and those are more haphazard, but... Um, so Victorian houses, early 20th century houses, were often built on the sites of uh, old orchards. And very often they left trees standing in the back gardens as existing as existing mature planting. So you can look at old maps, you can talk to the neighbours. That's very, very important, actually. I mean, there's often orchards marked up on, uh, on OS maps. Then there's things like street names and orchard close i mean sometimes it's a cynical marketing ploy from the estate agents or sometimes it's it's a genuine reference to the fact that the the road in question was was built on the site of an old orchard um and then of course there are a range of online resources and organizations there's the people trust for endangered species and the urban orchard project for example so to find your own local orchards is your own personal research project Mm. Oh, yeah, it sounds brilliant. Um, how has our relationship changed with orchards over the centuries then? Um, it's it's evolved significantly. I mean, apples originated in the mountains of Kazakhstan, the Tian Shan Mountains, and they came down the um, what would become the Silk Roads as early as the Bronze Age. There were mummies found in the Taklamakan Desert, um, which had fruit remnants on them. And they went down to Persia and the specific varieties, they developed grafting there so we could conserve specific varieties. And then it's thought that they were spread up through Europe by the Romans. Um, and fruits growing has had its highs and lows throughout throughout history. Um, for example, um, you know, the Black Death and the Viking um, incursions were bad for fruit as well as bad for people. But there have been some real high points as well. So, for example, um, around the Norman Conquest, a lot of new varieties came into um, into, into the UK uh, with, with the Normans. And then Henry VIII, I mean, he might have had rather suspicious and dodgy sort of marital relations, but he was very, very into his tree fruit. And he sent his fruiterer, his chief fruiterer, out to France, who came back with a great store of grafts, so they say, and cherries as well, and created wonderful, great orchards in Kent that then um, dispersed the varieties around the country. And the Belgian um, fruit growing and consumption lasted for several hundred years after his death. Um, But more recently, in the 20th century, the uh, apple orchards, the traditional, what we consider to be an old-style orchard, they they, they suffered due to commercialisation. Dwarfing rootstocks were developed and new sort of high yielding varieties were developed and it became more of a kind of rotational crop um, rather than something which was standing there for hundreds of years and just gradually replenished Um, and a lot of orchards were destroyed just because they became less efficient than than the dwarf high cropping trees. So what could we do if we wanted to conserve varieties that were local to our area? Well we could absolutely grow them Um, (laughs) <laughs> as I say it's about research it's about looking at the websites it's about talking to local people it's like looking to the local history you know, very often if you go to a village pub or, a pub or an older pub in a city there are local old maps um, or the ordnance survey all the resources I mentioned previously so finding out what was local or regional or what was developed I mean a lot of the, the Victorian varieties are very localised um, and 
you don't have to grow a great big apple tree for it to be just as valid and just as tasty. You can have them grafted onto dwarfing rootstocks or semi-dwarfing rootstocks for smaller gardens. Um, you, know, you can combine with your neighbours so everybody grows a different local tree or set up that community orchard if there's a little bit of central land, um, perhaps in in, in uh, yeah, where there was a bit of space on a housing estate or talk, talk, look around, look and see where a community orchard might be. I love the idea of starting a community orchard. Um, is it easy to do or um, are there kind of challenges involved in it? Well, there's challenges involved in all sorts of things involving multiple people and gardening. Um, but it's, it's about planning. It's about coming up with a plan, a workable plan, and doing the research and setting it up. So you have to find out what you want to achieve. Um, it needs to be more than just a pipe dream. You need to think about where it might be, where the, who might own the land, um, and whether or not that bit of land is actually going to be good for the trees to grow on. Um, you might want to think what the orchard is going to be used for. I mean, is it going to be for community parties? Is it going to be to create, um, put beehives in to create local honey as well? Can, can you exhibit sculpture in it? Can there be local schools use? I mean, with any community effort, the buy-in of the local population, the house owners, the business owners, the schools, even the local shops can be absolutely key and there have to be plans in place of management and practical care. Mm. I, well, that moves on nicely to the second part of your book, which is actually about designing orchards. And obviously, I think most people would traditionally consider an orchard to be underplanted with grasses, possibly wildflowers. But as you just mentioned, uh, you can use them to to exhibit sculpture. You can use them for all different sorts of things. Um, so what are some of the more unusual things that you've seen orchards underplanted with or, or used for? Oh, gosh. I mean, in terms of ornamental ornamental garden impact i really think that fruit trees are beyond par i mean it's, it's just it's just they are just the best i mean if you, in, even in a small garden or in a large orchard the structure they have is incredible and underneath them you can plant all sorts of things so small bulbs i mean my own orchards in west wales are planted with swathes of snowdrops and above that um the wildflowers come up on top but I've seen them underplanted with camassias, for example, um, which is a very, very beautiful site because they come out with that beautiful sort of um, illuminated blue at the same time as the, the pink and white apple blossom. So that's absolutely wonderful. Um, but you can formalise that. So you could put them, for example, in a box parterre or whatever. Small leaf evergreen is not going to get eaten up by box moth. Um, <laughs> um, and, and then you could underplant with bulbs and then perhaps replant with something like asters and, and um, dahlias for later in the season. So you can surround them with, with seasonal flowers of all descriptions. Hmm. Um, I've seen them trained against the wall with roses and they can they can all sorts of exciting and different ways to plant uh, fruit trees. Yeah, that I, as I said, that I think a lot of people might find that quite shocking because they do have this traditional view of orchards. Can you think of any in particular that are really good examples that people might be able to see photographs of? Well, there are all sorts of places you can go and then see um, tree fruit used in an ornamental fashion. Um, there's West Green House in Hampshire. That's really nice. There's lots of beautiful espaliers um, around the veg beds. And also she's um, raised the crown of um, crab apples around the lawn so that's very very attractive there uh, Grays Court near Henley has a very attractive orchard which sort of segues into the veg patch also and of course Grave Tye Manor in Sussex is that's a very very beautiful thing and if you want to see the Camassias in full spate in, in spring then head down to Grave Tye Manor. Mm. I think even at Great Dixter they've got a number of fruit trees in amongst their borders and they work perfectly well underplanted with all sorts of things so <laughs> Well, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely, yes. I mean, um, putting them as a border structure, a border specimen and just gardening around them, as long as you don't hassle the roots too much, um, they should do absolutely fine. And again, it's, it's, it's good use in a small garden to, to layer up that planting. Mm, definitely. Um, I don't know whether they would be used more ornamentally in that instance or whether they would be seriously harvested for fruit, but I guess it depends what the access is like. 
Yes, yes. But um, the point of my book, An Orchard Odyssey, is that one needs to purpose the tree fruit and purpose the orchard according to your space and time and lifestyle. So if you've got a big space for community orchard or a semi-commercial orchard, that's one consideration. There's no reason why that can't be used for bees and for sculpture and for wassailing. But if what you have is a small urban garden, then and you want to put tree fruit in amongst the herbaceous borders and the dahlias and um, sort of tucked in next to the roses, I don't see why that should necessarily be a problem because then you have the varieties you want, you have the flavours you want. There's just that that pleasure of going out and picking something lovely and ripe off a tree that you've grown yourself, no matter how small. Then, and that's what it's all about: re-establishing that personal connection with, with the orchard that you, you want to have, the orchard of your dreams. Mm, yeah, that's an excellent point. So, if you were putting them into your garden to try and help wildlife, um, is are they noted for their for the amount of wildlife they do support? Um, very much so, yes. Um, so, and your traditional orchard is absolutely splendid for wildlife, and that's because it's undisturbed or relatively undisturbed over a long time. And as the trees age and die, they become um, that they that they become good habitat for a whole range of beetles and insects and. Um, fungi and all sorts of things um, and then they plant new ones in so you get that sort of continuum um, but even within a domestic setting the blossom will still provide food for pollinators butterflies bees moths um, the birds will still be able to eat the fruit you know the, the beetles will, will, will still sort of fossick around I and mean, it's it becomes part of a patchwork, and I found when trying to make my own urban garden um, important for wildlife that how effective it is depends on the amount of greenery and trees locally. So in, in many ways, to encourage the wildlife in your own garden, you need to encourage the neighbours to encourage wildlife in theirs. But even planting one fruit tree will provide nectar and pollen and it will provide food for caterpillars and various things and you know it, 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 it becomes a relatively undisturbed area and that stability and connection with other tree fruit is quite important mm, yeah agreed could you just tell us about the story of johnny appleseed well johnny appleseed is a really interesting character because uh, when the pioneers got to america they took a load of um, apples with them and the european grafts didn't necessarily do so well in the, in the um, very hot or cold or wet or dry american climate but you got a lot of uh, they also took lots and lots of seeds, which were very genetically diverse. And that's how the concept of American apple pie came by. I and mean, apples are, aren't native by any stretch um, in America. But Johnny Appleseed created these little seedling orchards all the way along the, the, these routes. As the, as the wagons rolled west, Johnny Appleseed, he walked hundreds and hundreds of miles. And he was a real, real character. Um, and there's this wonderful image of this, of this chap with a his, his bag of apple seeds sort of strewn to the left and strewn to the right. Um, and he, he's a real life folk myth. So he was sort of ragged but barefoot, yet saintly. And he was certainly itinerant. He was a sort of apple growing tramp, really. Um, <laughs> and, and he was, he was, he was vegetarian and highly religious. I think he might have been quite an unusual company. But um, in terms of making sure that the, the pioneer families, when they, when they, stopped pioneering and started building homesteads and they could actually carry fruit trees with them for that comforting taste of apples um he sort of helped help the pioneers kept keep fed um and sustain their families in this very harsh and, and unstable new world so he's a fantastic character yeah, yeah he's definitely worth reading up on i'm sure if people wanted to get hold of a copy of your book or uh, even perhaps see you giving a talk um, where could they find out more? Um, my book is widely available. It's published by Green Books um, and it's in all good bookshops, obviously, um, but you can also buy it on Amazon. Um, and I do do talks if anybody would like to get in touch. Um, so, yes, and it's my book is very much about about engaging with the tree fruit, engaging with the heritage and thinking about it in a new way um, for lifestyle and for uh 
in landscape and wherever you are you can have that connection to orchard fruit i mean it's it's conceptual but it's about one's personal journey it's about mine and the journey of the fruit and the development and the history and there's a lot of interesting stuff so but i think that as far as orchards go you need to weave weave them into the gold of your choosing um and and i i really want people to go out and, and enjoy the fruit that's around them We should all definitely be enjoying the fruit that grows in our gardens and indeed in our local vicinities. Thank you to Naomi for taking part in the interview. And if, like me, you want more ways to enjoy your apples than eating them fresh off the tree, and particularly if you're concerned about food waste and are looking for ways to ensure your crops don't go to waste, you will love my next guest, Sassy Yasumi, who runs Eve Apple Press down in Hastings in East Sussex. Sassy has an ingenious solution to dealing with and preserving those crops that can sometimes go unused. I thought we'd start by finding out exactly what you do in your business. Okie dokie. So um, I run a mobile apple press and I also make apple juice for sale. It's as sustainable as I can make it business and Mm. it's trying to help people just to, to, to sort of feel a bit differently about their garden fruit because there's you know there there are no um there are no sort of you know we talk about food waste quite a lot but we but there are no there's no mention of of the the reality of our garden fruit waste you know whereas you know in years gone by we would have we would have you know picked everything and used it and you know nowadays people are just you know don't even realize that they could possibly eat their apples mm, you know they're going oh blimey can you can you eat them you know <laughs> yes <laughs> yes you wow. can <laughs> that's quite scary you're obviously you can only go so far um geographically are there other people oh. doing what you do or is your business quite unique I think it's really unique. Um, I don't think that there are other people who do like a mobile service. I know that you can take your apples to places that are static to go and get your apples pressed. But um, I did a lot of research um, around this. So um, when I was researching, I sort of um, found out that, you know, you can go to farms or various places to get your apples pressed. Or they might have a special apple day where you can take your apples. Apples are really heavy to carry and you take your apples to a place they'll do them for you but you're not always guaranteed that you're going to get your apples back they obviously sometimes they'll just put them in a big you know load with a load of other people's apples and and you get a quantity of apple juice back so my reason for doing what I'm doing is because of this whole having to cart things about and then you know you've got to make a special effort to go there go and collect your apple juice as well but I just thought it's it was sort of um, looking, um, going back to sort of, you know, more sort of traditional lifestyles of being able to, you know, to, to do things within your community. So um, it saves people having to sort of cut their apples all over the place and they they get apple juice made on site. They help with it. So they all, they feel really part of it. And, that, and so they can say, look, I've, I've made a load, you know, they can say that they've made their own apple juice. Hmm. which which is great and so it's not like oh, I've sent it off somewhere they get involved in the whole, whole process you know often their kids take part and it, it, it's a real nice thing to do as a family or as a group or you know community mm. so you need to franchise it well that's ideally something that I'd like to do because it um, me testing this out here it it's great it, you know it really it really works and and you know, year on year, there are more, you know, every client who I had last year, I've got two more because of their contacts, basically. Mm. So it would be really nice to be able to do something like that, to make to make this a thing that happens all over the country, because I mean, there are apples galore everywhere. Yeah. So how many apples do you need to have? What's the sort of minimum requirement? Well, I don't state a minimum requirement um but um i mean i could i can i can do i can do sort of 300 kilos 400 kilos mm. of apples um there's a limit because of the sort of pasteurizing aspect of it but i i, I let the clients f- finish the job off 
Um, but again, I've had some people who've said, oh, look, I've just got some apples and, and, and I don't want to see those apples go to waste. And I don't, you know, and and what happens is like next year they go, oh, wow. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do next year. We'll invite the neighbours or we'll do something else. And so it becomes a bigger thing. So, you know, people often don't really know what to expect when they they sort of see this thing that says, oh, get your apples pressed. They go all right then. And, you know, I've rocked up to some people's houses and they've just got a couple of carrier bags and I've just gone, oh, that'll take me five minutes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, 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 which was great. And then they, then they realise that actually – you know, so they said, well, next year, well, I'll be much more organised and I'll get them all picked. You know, I don't think they, you know, it, it, because this is something that is unique and doesn't normally happen, that people, you know, don't know what to expect. So, yeah, mm. sometimes they have loads, sometimes they have very few. And if you had a couple of trees of different varieties, can you bung them all in together? Does that matter? They're apples and right. it's making apple juice. So I don't specify anything. I mean, my own apple juice that I make, it's a mixed batch because that's it is apple juice. I'm not it's not anything particular. It tastes of apples. It's apple juice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, pe- people often, you know, that, that, that they go, oh, I've just got I've got some cooking apples. Can I chuck them? And I go, yeah, you know, just chuck it all in because you get a much more varied type of taste. Mm. um with, with a variety of apples some, sometimes depending on, on on what you've got but you know o- often the um mixtures of of different types of juices that they've just m- more complex sort of tastes and flavors and you just go oh, wow i can taste a bit of that and oh, it's got this note it's, it's a bit like wine mm. yeah it sounds, sounds exactly like wine actually yeah does it tend to be individuals who approach you or do you work for people who've got kind of orchards as well well, yeah, um, all sorts of people. So I've got um, people who have got some who've got small orchards. Um, I, yeah, um, I've got people who've got a tree. I've got you know, yeah. So a, a whole wide range of, of, of different people. Um, people who've got um, farms and got some apples and want their apples processed. Mm-hmm. So yeah, all, all sorts of different sorts of uh, clients. Yeah. So when you, um, as you said, you leave the clients to pasteurise it. Uh, how long could it keep for potentially if you did it right? It's a year. It's got a year's um, lifespan. Right. Okay. And do they provide so you, all their own bottles and everything as well? No, I provide the whole kit for the whole service. So the first, so if so, the first time you um, want your apples done. I'll provide everything that you need. So if you want to make cider, I've got the yeasts. If they want to use yeast, Demi John's, all the rest of it, you know, I can provide all, all of that. And all, I also provide all the bottles because um, although you can use your own bottles if you want to, um, my pasteurizer fits a certain amount of my size bottles in, and they're all they're all standard. They're a standard size, and it and it works really well. So what I say to my clients keep your bottles wash them out and then next year you don't have to buy bottles off me so the following year it becomes a cheaper service for them and they're saving their bottles and their lids and you know that that works really well as as well and people really like to sort of feel that they're you know you know doing some sort of recycling you know with their bottles as well as with their apples so it's just, it just becomes cheaper you know the, the first time first year because you've got to buy all the bottles and glassware is not cheap um it just makes sense for people just to keep hold of their bottles or and and reuse them so that's that's another sort of benefit of using this my service as opposed to taking them somewhere else because um other places don't let you do that right yeah i mean it's such it sounds brilliant because you just come and kind of do everything and it's all there and there really is no effort it sounds amazing yeah, that, that, that's the other the other thing because I think it's you know it is an effort to go and t- pick your apples and take them somewhere, then have to go back and, and collect your bottles. But it's a really nice experience for people that when they get involved and it's you know you know they like to watch it. They'll take photos. They'll sort of go. Oh, they'll phone people up and go. Oh my gosh, we're getting our apples pressed, and it's you know it becomes really you know a really good thing. And and once they've done it one year, you know they're quite quite you know I've got I've had, I've got returned clients and they really like it and they've had this you know they've had their apple juice they've given it as gifts they you know they just love saying oh you know I've, th- these are from our trees this this juice and it's good mm, it sounds brilliant so if talking about the juice if you um 
if you had, I don't know, two carrier bags of apples and I, you know, you came along and, and juiced them for me, how much juice could I expect? And would it depend on what type of apple they were? It does depend on the type of apple, but um, on average, I say about um, two kilos of apples makes approximately about a bottle of juice. Mm. It's, it's a little bit more more than that. But again, if you've got something like a couple of carrier bags of, of stuff and if you're local, then, you know, save me coming to get all the staff out to say, oh, you can bring it around and we, we'll just do it here when I'm doing another batch. You know, because it's quite, it's, it's heavy stuff to cart about as well, but. Mm, well it is yeah. do, and is there a sort of set time that you can do it do you have to do it between uh, you know certain months of the year yeah well apple season starts sort of august although it's sort of slightly getting earlier and earlier so sort of august to about sort of sort of november mid-november i mean different apples will ripen at different times times of the, of the year of, of, of the season as well so you you do still get apples you know, that are ready sort of later on in the colder months as well. So sort of end of November. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and and different apples will also store as well. So you could, you know, not all apples store very well. So no. like the, uh, the early apples, like the discoveries, they're not good keepers. So they're great just to pick really early on and they're a lovely sort of pinky colour. And it's just like, oh, wow, look. It's apple season again. <laughs> <laughs> and if they had been in storage, I'm assuming the juice content drops, does it? Um, the, the longer, once you pick an apple, if you, you leave it a couple of days, it does become more juicier. Um, I don't, you know, they, they unless unless they sort of really start to shrivel up. I mean, some apples keep their shape and form really, really well. And, that you know, they're, 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 still, they're still good the juice but um i don't tend to store apples i'll store apple juice right because you know it's um you know again it's well you need you need the space and i don't have the space for trays and trays of of apples to be all laid out somewhere cool and you know you've got to check them regularly because it's it's you know one bad apple Mm. it does it's it, it 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 makes the rest go as well uh, so I heard you talking at a talk and you were mentioning also that there were kind of orchards in the vicinity where we live where the fruit doesn't get used for anything. So are you also going around and, and collecting that type of fruit and making use of that? Yeah, I, I, I just go anywhere that there are apples, mm-hmm. basically. So whether it's um, people with a with a tree saying, I'll come and take my apples, um, I, I try and do that, you know, as a sort of community type of a of a thing. Um, but it's you know it's it's more efficient for me to go somewhere where there's quite a few apples and 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 and, and take there because then I can get large, larger quantities. But you know, I, I'll I'll go around and, and get some small bits and pieces from people as well. But yeah, there are plenty of orchards um, in you know in the surrounding area that that don't get picked that that do just sit there. Mm. so yeah you know yes there's a a bit of scrumping going on (laughs) and is it it, this may be a daft question is it just apples can you do it with other fruit um i've done pears and grapes so the um, the way that my um equipment works it doesn't work for stone fruit because you know you can't chop them up basically so anything soft um so apples pears and grapes yeah i've made sort of grape juice and pear juice for people as well so Mm. God, yeah. it sounds amazing. So if someone was in the area of kind of Hastings, well, how far do you travel out and how would they get hold of you? Um, I, I go I go into Ken. I go, well, it, it, but basically, I mean, if, if someone just gives me a ring and just, you know, I sort of find out where they are, I'm, I'm happy to sort of, you know, go, go, you know, go wherever is needed, basically, because it's, um, you know, their apples will just go to waste. And it's it's just nice to be able to make, apple juice for people so that they can use their fruit mm. um i you know i've um, there was a bloke up in tunbridge um but luckily he and he just wanted cider making and that's re- cider making is you know just making the juice for cider i didn't have to do anything it, it very complicated just juice it and whack it into some demijohns or fermenting buckets so um rather than going to tunbridge like for an hour's work he he came to his mum's in tastings and we just did it there and it just took an hour and it was it was great mm. god it's so easy to do have you got a website where people could get hold of you yes so it's um eve apple press is the name of the uh, 
yeah, of, of my venture, and that's the website. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. And is that dot co uk? Co dot uk. Yep. Yeah. Yep, fantastic. Yep, yep. I couldn't help thinking when Sassy was talking about other people's pressing facilities where you take your apples along and they get thrown in with everyone else's and you don't know whose juice you get in the end. It it kind of put me in mind of crematoriums and the story that when you get your loved one's ashes, they're mixed in with other people's, which is apparently an urban myth, according to Google, but I can neither confirm nor deny that. The links to Sassy's website and also to Naomi and her book are in the show notes. Thank you to Sassy and Naomi and thanks to you for listening. If you have any feedback on this episode or any others, please do get in touch with me via email or social media. And please keep on sharing the episodes with anyone you think might be interested. And a very big thank you to my new Patreon supporters. You are making my life a little bit easier and I'm very grateful to you. I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk but you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter, which gives you a weekly roundup of content, plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All. Roots and All.